it has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing messages of hope around the world. Jean-Francois Gravelet was born in France in 1824. At a young age, he found his calling. When he was only five years old, he strung a rope between chairs and attempted to walk the tightrope. He fell off that rope, but it would be the last rope that he ever fell from. He was sent to an acrobat school and at the young age of eight became known as Boy Wonder or Little Wonder. Eventually, Jean would be known as Charles Blondin, or the Great Blondie. He would become known as the greatest tightrope walker to ever live. He walked tightropes until he was 70 years old. His act was both a great show of ability and showmanship. His most famous act is his crossing of Niagara Falls. He would stretch a rope almost 400 meters in length from the Canadian Falls to the U.S. side. Blondin would famously cross the falls blindfolded, on stilts, pushing a wheelbarrow, and even pausing on the rope to eat breakfast. However, the most terrifying of his stunts was an offer to carry someone on his back across the falls. No one would volunteer. So Blondin's manager, Harry Colcord, was forced into duty. As recorded in the book, Blondin, his life and performances, Blondin gave these instructions to Colcord. Look up, Harry. You are no longer Colcord. You are Blondin. Until I clear this place, be a part of me, mind, body, and soul. If I sway, sway with me. Do not attempt to do any balancing yourself. If you do, we will both go to our death. Colcord had a choice. Would he trust Blondin or choose his own way? Not trusting would surely cost him his life. The real story of Noah is a story of trust. Many have perceived the story of Noah to be the story of a harsh, unforgiving God. Many have thought that God is a vengeful tyrant. However, a careful study of God's word in the Bible demonstrates the complete opposite. The story of Noah and the flood paint a picture of God who is very patient and gracious and trustworthy. It paints a picture of a God who is seeking to make the universe perfect once again and seeks to reconcile his relationship with humankind. A relationship which he himself did not break. It was a relationship broken by mankind when the choice was made to be disobedient and sin against God. The flood was an attempt to bring things back around in a world that had become so corrupt that man's very nature was evil to the very core. God gave man an abundance of time to turn things around and turn from his evil ways. He provided ample opportunity and then he provided a safety vessel in the ark built by Noah. He sent a message in the name of Methuselah, a name that meant at his death, it will come. And the flood did come the very year of Methuselah's death. But Noah also preached for 120 years, actively warning of the impending doom. And then he built a boat, a boat that was the width of a hockey rink, the length of two and a half hockey rinks and the height of almost 16 meters. God sent warning after warning, yet only eight people got on that boat. Just Noah and his wife, along with their children and their spouses. Only eight people. Friend, not only is the story of Noah the story of grace mercy, and the justice of God. But it is also 
the story of warnings gone unheeded. It is the story of mankind ignoring his creator. It is the story of neglect. The story of Noah speaks to our heart and tells us of one who is seeking to repair a relationship. The story of Noah is a reminder that Jesus is setting up a new kingdom and a world of perfect peace and happiness. It is a reminder that God will not allow things to continue down this road of violence and terror. He's setting up a new kingdom and that new kingdom is coming and he wants you to be there. Jesus is coming again to make all wrongs right and he wants you to be in the new earth. Friend, let's look to the example of Noah. And as Genesis 6, 9 states, it speaks of how Noah lived in this earth. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Friends, let's look to Noah, who yielded his life to the Lord and followed the Lord. Let's not follow the ways of those who didn't get on the ark. Let's yield our hearts to the one who is the repairer of hearts. But what such a powerful lesson about the character of God, what would happen on this earth? Obviously, things didn't continue in their purity and righteousness. The world today tells us that even with starting over, evil has risen again. How long did it take though? How long did it take for things to go awry once again? Unfortunately, not very long. Genesis chapter 9, verses 20 and 21 tell us the sad, sad story. And Noah began to be a farmer and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. Although God had given Noah permission to eat of the clean animals of the earth, Noah also chose to farm and undoubtedly provide his sustenance through that farming. As a part of his farming, Noah planted a vineyard, and, and there is no question that he planted the vineyard for the grapes and for the juice of those grapes. Noah was familiar with the result of drunkenness and the terrible results of drinking fermented beverages. He would have seen that in the sin and rebellion of the pre-flood world, drinking was very harmful. No doubt Noah would have been familiar with the principles of drinking alcohol. He would have known God's timeless principle found later in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. He would have known the changeless principle found in Proverbs 23, Verses 31 and 32. Do not look upon wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Noah saw the results in the pre-flood world of what drinking alcohol does. But one of the beauties of the Bible is that it doesn't just give us the stories of victory. It doesn't just tell us the nice things, but it also shows us failures. Noah, as the Bible calls him, was a righteous man. Noah lived according to the truth found in 1 John 2.1, one, one of my favorite verses of the entire Bible. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The goal of the Bible, the goal of our relationship with Jesus is to live like Jesus lived and to live a victorious life under his grace. But if we might stumble, 
Jesus will lift us up and encourage us to continue on the path of eternal life. Part of the post-flood story is that our previous spiritual experiences and victories are no guarantee of future success in the spiritual life. Noah walked with God, but for a moment he took a detour. And isn't it interesting, in the aftermath of the flood, an extremely high spiritual moment, that's when Noah sins. Friends, we can never let our guard down. We need Jesus at every moment of every day so we can be faithful to him. And while Noah had this weak moment, it led to another sin. Not his own sin, but to the sin of another individual. Genesis chapter 9 continues the story of Noah and continues this sad chapter in the story of Noah. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away and they did not see their father's nakedness. Noah's drunkenness led him at some point to disrobe and in disrobing, he would have been completely naked and exposed himself. Now, God has made it clear in his word that it is shameful for a man to expose himself in such a way. What Noah did was shameful. However, Ham acted even more shamefully. Upon finding his father, he could have privately covered him. But instead, he broadcast the embarrassment to his brothers. Now, some have come up with some very creative thinking on what it means that Ham saw the nakedness of his father. But I like what the Bible knowledge commentary directly says about this text. Many fanciful ideas have been proposed, but the Hebrew expression here means what it says. Ham saw his father's nakedness. He was not involved with Noah sexually, for in that case, the Hebrew would have been translated, he uncovered his father's nakedness. Instead, Noah had already uncovered himself and Ham saw him that way. Now, because of Ham's sin and his own character, the generations that followed him no longer desired to follow God, but they desired to follow their own ways. What then did these descendants do? Well, we read on later in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 11, and it tells us the story of what happened with those descendants. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we should be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. This group of people decides to build a city. And there is nothing inherently wrong with the city in general. However, these people were instructed to scatter and multiply upon the earth. Yet an even more problematic issue was their building of a tower to the heavens. Why would they do such a thing? Is it possible that this group of people was trying to make their own way and create their own salvation? Now, some might say, well, what do you mean by that? Here, here's what I mean. These descendants no doubt ha would have been familiar with the story of the flood. They knew of the destruction that had happened on the earth. And so now, in order to avoid any other type of pending destruction and to escape the possible judgment of God, they were going to build a tower to the heavens and avoid any possibility of destruction by a flood. However, in so doing, they were directly rebelling against God. 
and they directly rebelled against his promise. They made a decision to trust in their own way and to do their own thing. They made a choice. They made a choice to trust themselves and not to trust God and his ways. These ancient people were intelligent and God could not allow this to happen. So the Bible goes on to tell us in Genesis 11 verses 5 to 9 what God did. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from over the face of all the earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Isn't it fascinating? The diversity of language and culture are all captured in just these few verses of the Bible. The language is confused. No longer can they communicate with one another effectively and the building stops. Can you imagine the scene? The mixers are speaking Polish and the brick makers are speaking Chinese and the brick layers are speaking French, so on and so forth. The confusion that would have been there would have been amazing. But I want you to take clear notice of the name that is given to this place, Babel. It literally means confusion. It is where God confused the languages. But of greater significance is the lesson that God is trying to teach us for today. It is a lesson that has been passed down through the pages of history. Here at this place called Babel, man made a decision, man made a choice to not follow the paths that God had outlined. They faced a choice to obey God or to obey the desires of their own heart and ultimately the ways of Satan. Here, Babel serves as a picture, a picture of rebellion and confusion, a picture of rebellion against God. Here at Babel comes to fruition the text found in Isaiah 55 and verse 8. Isaiah 55 and verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The lesson of Babel is that God's ways are best. But when we choose to go another way, we have placed ourselves on a road that has a very bleak outlook. This city of Babel in the land of Shinar would eventually become and be known as Babylon. Throughout time, Babylon would become a fitting symbol of rebellion against God. And what emerges throughout the Bible is the tale of two cities. It is the tale of a decision to be made by each individual on this earth. What emerges from the story of Noah and the flood is the story of a decision. It is the decision to follow God or to follow man. The fitting symbol that emerges from the story of Noah is Babylon as a city of rebellion. Throughout scripture, while Babylon represents a city of rebellion, Jerusalem represents the city of obedience and to submission to God's will and his way. We fast forward from the times of Noah to the time of Daniel. In the time of Daniel, you have the city of Jerusalem. It is home to God's people. But then you have Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar. 
Babylon became a city filled with the worship of idols and false god. Paganism abounded there. Babylon, the city of rebellion. Jerusalem, the city of obedience and submission to God. And there we find this fitting symbol of a choice to follow God or to follow man, to be in Jerusalem or to be in Babylon. And then later, it is in the book of Revelation that this choice comes to full view and has application for us today. The book of Revelation is a summary of the entirety of scripture. And the book of Revelation is a story of choices a story of the choice between the lamb and the dragon, between obedience and rebellion, between Jerusalem and Babylon. Babylon symbolized rebellion and religious confusion in these last days. Remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, verses 37 and 38. Matthew 24, verses 37 and 38. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Babylon was set up in the time just after Noah. The book of Revelation warns us of the religious confusion that exists in our day and in the days to come. In fact, Revelation chapter 17 and verse 5 says this about Babylon. Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. Babylon is the mother of harlots. What is a harlot? A harlot is a prostitute. Babylon represents the religious and spiritual institutions of our day that have prostituted themselves with the beliefs and traditions other than that which is found in God's holy word. So what is God's solution to Babylon? What is God's solution to this problem? Revelation 14 and verse 8 says this about Babylon. Babylon is fallen is fallen that great city because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Babylonian confused religion is bankrupt, friends. The scripture says it's fallen. God's way is the best way. And he's guiding us. He's leading us. We need to follow that counsel of Proverbs 3, 4, and 5, a text I'm sure you know well. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. The only surety in these last days is to stop trusting in ourselves and trust in God. Revelation finally makes this invitation in Revelation 18.4, where God says, come out of her, my people. God is calling people out of Babylon. He is calling them to the safety of his ark. He's calling us out of religious confusion into the arms of the safety of Jesus. The story of Noah is the story of a loving God trying to call you back home. The choice is yours. Will you choose him or will you choose your own ways? Will you come to the open arms of Jesus and into the ark of his safety? Or will you wander Are you on your own path? Harry Colcord got on the back of Charles Blondin and he trusted Blondin fully. He followed the instructions to a T and the two of them made it safely across. Friend, Jesus loves you. He died for you and he died for me. He's calling us home. He's saying, trust me fully. He's calling you and he's calling me to get on his back 
and hold on for our life. Friend, we don't have to be people with no home. Jesus wants you to be God's son and God's daughter. All it takes is for you to give your life to him. The choice is yours. What is holding you back today? Today, do you want to say to, to the Lord, the real Noah teaches me that I can trust God and I'm going to make the choice to trust him fully. Today, I give my life to him. Today, Jesus, won't you change my life and help me to follow you all the way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have seen from the story of Noah that it is an, a story of choices. And so today we choose to follow your son, Jesus. Please help us. Help us in our choice to be faithful to Jesus. Change us from the inside out, Lord, and help us to become like your son and be examples to those around us. Please be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear friend, the story of Noah teaches us about God, about a God who is gracious, who's loving, who's merciful, but who's also just. Our wonderful God reaches down and the story of Noah teaches that he wants to bridge the relationship, repair our relationship with him to save us and take us home. I hope you'll join us again next week until then, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.